Okay. It's official. It is. There's that. And so let me find my list. Okay. We'll just go through and um, feel free to just, you know, speak whatever you'd like about these different questions. Okay. There's no right or wrong answer that I'm looking for. I'm just, again, looking to um, share more joy and inspiration with people about getting better and that it is possible. And clearly to demonstrate that it probably takes a little bit more than just um, a pill to get yourself there. And it's going to take a little bit of effort. So without further ado, we'll start at the top of the list here. And um, may you just tell me a little bit more about how long you were sick and um, some of the things that happened to you as you were getting sick, please? Mm -hmm. That's a hard question to actually answer. I was reflecting back on it and I thought, well, officially I've had my Lyme diagnosis since June of 2022. So not that long, about seven months. I got sick with COVID prior to that. So that was in December of 2021. When I had COVID, I had, I had the traditional loss of taste and smell, like pretty sick for a couple of weeks. Um, and then I got better. You know, my taste and smell is a over a year. It's still not better. It's not gone, but it's not where it should be. Um, but some symptoms just didn't quite get better. So I had crazy fatigue. Like I couldn't, I couldn't sleep enough to feel rested. When I got sick with COVID, I noticed when I would sit and stand, my knees would ache. I'm like, oh, that's weird. I never have achy joints. You know, <laughs> I'm like, that's, that's a new feeling. Um, and then the crazy memory stuff started happening where I couldn't remember conversations that my kids told me I had with them a day ago. And they thought I was either multitasking because I'm guilty of doing that. Like we all are. And I'm on my phone sometimes more than I should be. So there have been times that I'm either working or just wasting time. And I don't hear everything that's said to me, but I said, no, this is happening. Like I, I shouldn't forget these things. So why am I not remembering important events in my life? Recent events, long-term memory was fine. Short-term memory was not. And then I'd be talking with people and I couldn't remember the word I wanted to use. And it, I would get stuck and I would get like, you might even see it when we're talking, like I would freeze for a moment, trying to remember the word that I was looking for. And I would have to rely on my husband a lot and he would feed me the word. And then the conversation would keep going. And I thought, well, that's not typical either. So I had all these symptoms. My daughter was already diagnosed with Lyme. So I thought this looks a lot like Lyme. This sounds a lot like Lyme. I have Lyme in my family. I'm guessing that this is probably Lyme. So I started the testing process for that. And that's how I was diagnosed. My long COVID was reactivated Epstein-Barr, mycoplasma, and Lyme. So right. that was over a year ago. 20, how old am I? 27 years ago, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder. So I have Graves' disease, which is a thyroid autoimmune condition. So I've been not a hundred percent well my whole adult life. So I normalized so many things in my life that I thought someone asked me, how are you? I was saying, great. I'm good. I'm healthy. Like I'm really, I'm good. I didn't get sick often. I, you know, would be living an active life. So I thought that I was healthy, but I didn't realize that most healthy people are not tired all the time. And I was tired all the time. And I don't, I don't know. I don't love the keyword that's trending of gaslighting, but when I would mention it to my endocrinologist, when I would mention it to my doctors, there was always an excuse for why a young mom would be tired or why, a, you know, a young person whose husband works in Manhattan, these crazy hours, and I'm alone during the week. Well, of course you're tired. Now you're a new mom. Of course you're tired. Now you're going back to work. Of course you're tired. It was normalizing a culture of tired. So I just thought this is how it is. My emotional health was always like running really high. Never knew that that was anxiety. I just thought I run high. Like I'm always going, I'm always worrying, but there's a lot to worry about. You have small kids. I'm homeschooling. My husband's working and traveling. There's life can have worries. 
So, but I didn't realize you're always, you're not supposed to always be worrying. That's right. not normal. So I normalized all these things. So if you say, how long have I been sick? My whole adult life. Didn't really realize this until the Lyme diagnosis finally shed light on a whole lifetime of things that just weren't quite right. So it was a giant opportunity for me to take what I had already learned about natural healing, but really look at it in terms of what does wellness look like and how do I want to feel knowing that I don't want to feel this way anymore. Like I want to walk into this next stage of my life, looking different, feeling different, and having just a whole different framework around what health and wellness means, because what I thought was healthy wasn't even close. Yeah. So long answer to a short question. Yeah. And that's why I think for most of us, it probably is. And you really brought up some good points. That I think a lot about our frame of reference, like we think we're healthy and we're doing what we're supposed to, when in fact, it's like so far from what we really should be doing for our bodies. And we're actually very sick and we don't even, we're not even aware of it. Um, mm-hmm. Again, talking back to some stuff we mentioned a little bit earlier before um, we got into this deeper conversation, but just like how they program us to accept things and, and touch on a lot of, of things. So it's interesting. I wonder how many people are actually sick and they don't realize it. Right. Um, so, and then, okay. So how long to diagnosis? I wonder too, do you think that 27 years ago, that was, uh, tick born related that, that I don't uh, know. Triggered all it definitely reactions? could be, it could be, I, there's a couple of things that make me think it probably was, I grew up in the woods. So I mean, in Connecticut, so I've had plenty of opportunities. Plus the fact that when I wasn't in Connecticut, I was in Cape Cod, which is now an endemic area. So I was on the beach, you know, kind of in the dunes doing all the things that I wouldn't do now, but we didn't think twice about it. Yeah. I hope, I hope as the testing develops, as they see need to like some of these labs, you know, the, the ones that are really on the the forefront of tick-borne testing, the vibrance and the hygienics. Like I, I hope that they somehow figure out a way to differentiate between the two. So that would be really helpful to a lot of people. It would be fantastic. Um, although sometimes maybe the results we might not want to know. So you know, true. Sort of true. That's like, oh, but I then at know. least maybe it would give credibility to us. Cause you know how many times people said to, oh, well, you see Lyme in everything. Everything's not Lyme. It's not, but I think a lot more is than what people realize. I, I think there's a too. lot of people walking around like me, you know, that had exposure at some point, had an immune system that was keeping everything under control until they reached that tipping point. For me, the tipping point was COVID, which we're all getting or have had now so many of us like me are having long issues. How many are related to Lyme? I I think a lot. And that's why whenever I get the chance, I tell people, if you're having any long symptoms, invest a couple hundred dollars, test yourself because then you know what you're dealing with and you don't have to just accept this as a way that it's just, it's, it will get better someday. Cause chances are it's not going to get better someday. And you don't have to suck this up and live like this for the rest of your life because a virus pushed you over the tipping point, because what's going to happen with the next illness or the next car accident or death in the family or some traumatic event that rocks your nervous system and send your remote, your immune system spiraling out of control. Like it's, it's going to happen. If it doesn't happen now, it's going to happen sometime. So know what you're dealing with. Very much so. That's I've often wondered about that too. People with Lyme, like maybe, maybe you just get bit enough times that eventually you just get sick. Maybe. Like I, I'm still not convinced. It's just, I mean, I guess it could just be one tick for sure, but I, I've also thought that people can probably get bit multiple times and then mm-hmm. it just tips them over the edge. Yeah, possibly. I would agree. Okay. Back to this then. Um, what helped you to heal, please? Well, a million dollars? <laughs> no. I think first of all was knowledge. When I realized in myself that these symptoms looked a lot like Lyme, I only knew that because I knew what Lyme looked like. So I think educating people about what 
this particular disease looks like helps because you and I know that the average person with Lyme spends a couple of years searching for answers, goes to at least 10 doctors, can't find answers, spends a lot of money doctor hopping, still can't find answers. So I was able to bypass all of that. I went straight to a doctor that was already working with my daughter, who was a neurological chiropractor. And I said, because I was having the neurological issues, those were my main concerns. And so I said, can you help me get my smell and taste back? And can you help me figure out why I'm having these, these memory and word recall issues? And so he isn't technically Lyme literate in the whole world of being an ILADS affiliated doctor, but he has had Lyme. So he is aware of what Lyme looks like, what Lyme can do and how it can affect people neurologically. So you know, he, yes, he was working with me, um, but he was the one that suggested that we run my first blood work panel. And he knew enough to tag on an ANA panel and to just add, I think he added the basic Western blot onto that blood work. So I don't think Western blot, anything came back, but my ANA panel lit up. <laughs> so, you know, he said, I don't know, you might have lupus. Like you have some markers that there's something going on. And I, I so remember telling him, thank you for this. I don't have lupus. I reject that. I already know I have one autoimmune. I'm not going to start collecting them. That's not going to be my story. So thank you for this. And he even said, I'm not the right doctor to take you to the next step, but here's what we found out. Get better testing for Lyme and get some better testing for this. So I had gone to a Lyme conference in Connecticut in May. So this is all around the same time. So I had the opportunity to listen to all these amazing doctors. Some were medical doctors, some were naturopathic doctors, doctor of osteopathy, osteopathy. I don't know how you say that. Um, all talking to a room full of mostly other medical practitioners, a few parents, a few nonprofits were sprinkled in there. So for a weekend, I immersed myself in who are the doctors near me? How are they treating? What's their philosophy? And I met a doctor there. And this is before I knew officially it was Lyme. I said, if I have Lyme, I want to treat with this doctor. So um, I went to her and I said, this is what I have. This is what I'm facing. Um, this is what I think it is. What do we, where do we go from here? So she was the one that kind of... Um, took over my care for the Lyme. She is a Lyme literate naturopathic doctor. So from start to finish, I mean, I got sick in December with COVID by May, I was in at least getting testing done by June. I knew what I had and I was already with a Lyme literate doctor. So the process was set up because I, I knew, and I have the opportunity running a nonprofit dedicated to Lyme that I, I already know a lot about, about this subject. You know, if I was facing something else, if it was lupus, then I would have no frame of reference for that. And I would really have to do a deep dive into educating myself, but because it was Lyme, I already had that education, unfortunately, to, to kind of speed up the system for myself. Yes. But fortunately, not unfortunately, mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> because unfortunately you might still be out there, True. you know, Absolutely. Around had you not had that. And so fortunately you knew what, what to do to support yourself a little mm -hmm. bit better, but it's unfortunate that you have it. Um, exactly. Yep. Had it. Yeah. Uh, okay. So at what, was there like a specific moment or, um, a specific time that you can remember that you knew you were going to get better or, um, any type of specific healing moment, or you were like, maybe looking out the window and you're like, oh, this fantastic sight. I know I'm going to get better kind of a thing. Yeah. For me, I never believed that I wasn't, there was never a moment. I just went into this. I knew I have a strong faith in, in God. And I just knew that I wasn't created for this. I wasn't created to be in a state of just unbalance and disease and unwell. Like I, we weren't designed that way. We were designed to be in balance, to be well, to be in harmony with our natural world around us. So I never questioned that I wasn't going to get better. Um, not to say that there weren't harder moments along the way and frustrations along the way, but it was never, I never had the mindset of if I get better, it was when I get better. So that's how I approached 
everything that I did. I will, I, I sought out therapies and protocols that really aligned with what I felt was best for me. And I embraced it fully. And I never really, I, to this day, I'm not a hundred percent where I want to be, but I'm also 51 years old. So I don't know, you know, I think expectations have to shift maybe for, you know, depending on the age and stage of life you're at, like, I'm really good. And if this is the best it gets, then I'm really good. But I really do think it can get better. I want my full taste and smell back. And I believe I will get that back. You know, I want, um, I want the hair that I lost to come back. And I believe that it will. There are days though, that I cry that I've lost so much hair. So, you know, in the, in the walk, I can't say like, Oh my God, I'm like so positive and I'm so optimistic. I, it's not a toxic positivity. It's just a mindset of belief. I believe that I will get better. And I don't doubt that for a second. Awesome. And I'm just curious, the hair loss was that from COVID? I don't, I, I, yeah, I believe it. And I believe the onset was COVID. It started falling out in March. So I was sick in December. It started falling out in March, which from what I've heard of other people's COVID stories, that timeline lines up perfectly. Correct. It also, it, it fell out. Then it got a little bit better and then it fell out again and it got a little bit better and now it's falling out again. So that also is coinciding with some of my perimenopausal symptoms, like timing of just cycle stuff. So I don't know if it has a hormonal component to it. Um, and I don't know if it has a Lyme component to it as well, because a, I've had Lyme for God knows how long, and I have never had a hair issue, but I do now. So did it start? I mean, it started before treatment. So I I'm trying to rule it out. It's it's COVID. The onset was definitely COVID. Is it compounded by hormonal issues? Possibly, but it's, um, it's out of all my symptoms, it's the hardest one for me emotionally to deal with. It, it took me a long time. This sounds so superficial, but I had short, really short hair my whole life. It was just always easy and it was micro pixie cut and, and it was fun and I liked it, but I always had this desire. I don't know where it came from that. I was going to turn 50 with this head of like wild, like curly hair. And so I had that happen for COVID was a perfect excuse to grow out my hair. So I wasn't going anywhere. I was working from home. I started a nonprofit during COVID. So I let my hair grow and it grew in curly and it grew in thick and I loved my hair. And when I turned 50, it was everything I wanted. And I know it's a stupid goal like to have, but it was my goal and I really wanted it. And I've lost, I mean, I would over half of my hair and I'm really fortunate wow. that I had a lot of hair to begin with. I can show you pictures though of me in March with my hair all the way down my, like yours, all the way down my back, thick, curly. I mean, two wraps of a hairband was all it took for me to pull my hair up. I could hold my hair up in a big, messy top knot and I loved it. Now, Oh, it's hard. It's hard to see how much falls out on, on the days that I wash my hair. It, it's, I, I shed a lot of tears. It, it's hard. It's hard to look at pictures of myself from a year ago, um, versus now, like I pull my hair back a lot because I just feel, I don't want to cut it all off. I don't want to years lose the years of growth that I invested into it. I want to have that hair back. And I believe I will, um, I'm doing the nutritional things. I'm doing the, the Lyme healing things. I'm resting. I'm working on my nervous system. I'm doing all the things. I just, hair takes a long time. And so it's going to take time. Yeah. And I could think of, um, two things that really help my hair a lot. Um, there's a oil called healthy hair oil. It's by Banyan botanicals, B A N Y A N botanicals. It's an Ayurvedic, um, concoction, which, you know, I, I study Ayurveda. Mm -hmm. but you take maybe a tablespoon or three quarters of a tablespoon and then you just rub it into your roots at night before yeah. you go to bed. Um, I try to do it once or twice a week, but you could probably do it every day if you really wanted to. Okay. And then depending on how your, your hair washes, like I don't have any problems making it come out of my hair, but sometimes people get oil like stuck in your hair. So you can just put your shampoo on before you actually make your hair wet. 
and that'll bind to the oil so it comes out of your hair faster or more cleanly. And then um, the other thing I would recommend that you consider taking is something called Bring Garage. Um, B H R I B H R I N G A R A J, I think is how we spell this. Bring Garage. I was going to go get my bag of, of it, it's, um, but it's a powder that I take and I put a little bit, and actually, what I'm drinking is my tea. Um, put a little bit of that in there and I drink that every day. And that's uh, really meant to, to grow your hair. Really? Um, okay. I've never called, heard of that. It, yeah. It translates to king of the bumblebees, which I don't quite understand what that has to do with hair, but. Okay. Um, yeah. So I will try it. It's cheap and easy, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Isn't that the way it usually is? It's just knowing <laughs> what, <laughs> what that's correct to, to do. And that's so correct. there's, there's things out there that I, I don't know. So like us, you don't know what you don't know. So having Thank you for that because I will yeah. definitely look into that. I hope it helps helps you. I've had two or three of my friends tell me that made a huge difference. And the one girl said her hairdresser said it's the healthiest healthiest he's ever seen her hair ever. Really? He's like, "What are you doing?" She's like, "Oh, you know, I've been using this oil." My friend told me, "You're like, yes." So I hope it works for you. Thank you. Because I do think that would be a very um, traumatic thing as a, a female. I often think like we get our period and that's got to be pretty traumatic but guys have to lose their hair and I feel like that would be really hard and Mm -hmm. I often think as a woman like oh god that would be so hard so I'm I'm sorry and I will pray for you that your hair comes in nice and thick and curly and beautiful just like you want it thank you yeah um all right so two questions left here um at what point did you know you were healed You know, I was talking with my doctor who I was doing acupuncture with, and we were just, I I adore her. Like we could be great friends. Um, We were just chatting about life and about kids and what we were up to. And I was running late that day and I was running off this, this list of everything that I was doing. I'm like, well, I had this and I was on this podcast and I had to do this for our financial gift for the nonprofit. And I'm going back to tutoring and I'm working And she's like, well, you know, maybe this version of tired is because you're actually doing all the things that you want to do. And she said, and and I needed to hear it, you know, to caution me, don't just slide back into that place where you're doing all the things and you're rushing here to get your treatment, you know, kind of reorder that. And don't, I think so many of us, you know, we want to get back to that life we had before and I found that I was, but I needed that check to be like, no, we know we don't necessarily want to go back to the place that we were before, because that is a contributing factor to why we ended up getting sick. You can't do all the things on the same day, but that's when I realized I'm like, wow, you know what? I was able to do all that. And I'm not taking naps in the afternoon for two hours. And I'm not waking up exhausted when I started doing my daily walks on the beach in the summer, like I'm in Connecticut. So walking on the beach is I could do it. It's certainly possible. I don't like to do it, but in the summertime, every single day, that's how I started my day with my feet in the water and in the sand with the morning sun and the, the seagulls. And it was the perfect thing for me to do at that stage, because we all know the grounding and the morning light. And I slept better than I've ever slept in my entire life. And I'm happy to say I've been able to supplement other things. Like I use my happy light. Now I have, I bought a red light panel. I invested in that for myself. Um, and so I realized I have, I have energy. I have real energy because COVID took away my ability to have coffee. I can't stand the taste of coffee and I was a coffee drinker. So I'm not artificially caffeinating myself to get energy. I'm drinking my matcha in the morning with my turmeric and my cinnamon. And it's beautiful. And I love it. And then I'm getting, you know, my light therapy on days like this, where frigid air is moving in and I'm walking in the forest. Like I was a few days ago by a waterfall on days when I can do that. And I'm, I'm happy and I have energy and I'm teaching, which I love. And I'm running a nonprofit that I love. And when my doctor kind of made me realize like, Hey, look at what you're doing. And you couldn't do that when you came here, like you, you were still napping every day. I went, wow. Like it's working and I'm, and I'm healthy and I feel good. And I'm feeling like at 51, so much better than I did, you know, at 41 or even at 31. So, you know, I'm excited for this stage of life. I'm excited to walk into this 
next phase of my life of having young adult children and launching them off and, and being able to focus on the things that are good for me and make, bring me joy and doing it while constantly and continually working on being as healthy as I can. I'm excited for you. Like, thank you. Just hearing that, it like makes me so excited. I'm like, yes, the doer, she can go again. Like, look at her go. And yeah. I think we think so like beautiful. healing is this big light bulb moment. Like it's not like, because we're not taking the pill or, or you know, doing this like instantaneous thing. It's not like we're taking a Z pack for, for strep throat. And then all of a sudden the strep throat, like you feel like, Oh, the sore throat's gone. I'm healed. Like that's not how it works with chronic illness. As you know, like there is no moment where you're just like, Oh, you know, my, like that treatment's done and I am, I'm good. I'm healed. Like we sometimes don't see it. And so I think we need people around us to, to point it out when we don't often see it ourselves, because again, like I haven't had this as long as some, well, I have, but I haven't been symptomatic as long as other people have. And this is my theory. The longer you are symptomatic, I can imagine the harder it is to see your own healing because like me normalizing how I felt all my life, you're also no, a, you're identifying with your illness. So you have Lyme, my Lyme, like we, we, we internalize it in a way that we shouldn't. It's not ours. It wasn't meant for us. We came into contact with us, but we don't have to own it. Um, and we normalize all the things that we feel. And so I think these little glimpses of, of healing moments that happen sometimes just get overlooked because we're not used to focusing our attention on them. We're used to focusing our attention on, you know, all the treatments we have to do and the costs we have to pay and the doctors we have to see and the, the, the groups that we're on that may be feeding into that, that cycle of, of illness rather than a celebration of moments of wellness. So yeah, I think it's, it's, it's complicated. Yes. But, um, I think that's a really good point in that when you're in it for so long, it's really hard to see sometimes the progress. And when you live it every day, um, it can be very difficult to consciously measure that, um, intangible change. And I often think for people like, um, I recommend sometimes that they do a scale of one to 10 every day and like gauge how you feel. Um, and that would encourage me sometimes that I could see like improvement that way. Like, okay, it's not a 10, at least today I've got a couple of eights in there. Or I've got it, you know, like good. So it's going in the right direction, Yeah. but, um, that's a very valid point. And it is when you're sick for so long, like that's normal. And then how do you really pull yourself apart from that? How do you really differentiate what is sickness and what is you? Right. Um, so mm -hmm. And I've seen people, especially, you know, younger people really, I don't know if they look through their social media, especially with Instagram where everything's so neatly summarized in your little squares where you can see patterns of, you know, they're really sick, you know, they're in bed, they're hooked up to their infusions, they're, they're taking their, their medications. And that's what they're posting about for a long time. And then suddenly someone that I know, like, she's now working and she has a job and she's going to the gym and that's what she's posting on. And then there'll be a period of a, a week or two where she's not feeling so good. And she's posting about the harder things, but then she's back to posting longer about the job and the gym and the going out. And, and I thought if you could read your social media, like a diary, you would see, there would be little glimpses. Like, I don't, I have a love hate with social media. So I don't share, I share more on Facebook than on Instagram. Um, but if you were to look at it, you would see for me, it's not, it's not authentic in that I'm not putting out like all the, the harder moments. I do that more on Facebook. So if I were to print out my Facebook, like a journal, then that would read like a book of, okay, I was, this was hard for me. This is a hard day for me. This is what I'm dealing with, but Hey, this is the hike I took. This is my day at the beach. This is when I traveled. So I think sometimes just using what we have to go back and reflect on, it becomes like that, you know, you can almost rate it by where was I that day? You know, what was I able to eat that day? What was my energy? I was able to go to New York city. I was able to go on a plane and, and go travel. And yes, there may have been a period after that, that you had to recover from, but was it a shorter period than a year ago? So 
you know, we all are capturing our lives in different ways right now. And I think if we kind of look back on that in our, with, I don't know, like to use it as a reference, you know, for our own life, yes. Yes. then I think we would, we would be able to see those moments clearer. Yes. That's a very good point too. Almost like a time capsule. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. And our last question here, is, do you have any words of advice other than things that you've already shared? or encouragement for those that are still trying to find their way? Yeah, for me, I, I really strongly feel for people who have lost hope and feel like there's not hope in healing. And so I believe that we give each other hope that if we're in isolation and illness, especially chronic illness is isolating We may not have, especially the younger people have access to our friends, might not be able to go to school in a traditional way, like they envision doing. Dating might be problematic when you have chronic illness. So you find yourself more and more and more isolated. And I think when that happens, it's very easy to get more and more and more hopeless in the situation. So it's community. Like my, my biggest advice to people is have (laughs) some type of community and have it be a a supportive community. For me, when I started Partner in Lyme, it was right when COVID started happening. And moms, you know, especially because I was at the time was caring for my daughter who has been very open about her Lyme journey. And she was very sick and has, you know, cycled in and out of, of periods of being healthy and being sick. You know, we lost opportunities to gather together. So we couldn't just have a cup of coffee with a friend at a coffee shop or in, per, you know, at someone's house. So I started doing virtual coffee talks. So I said, you know, grab a cup of coffee. If you're caring for someone with Lyme, jump on Zoom. We did it weekly and 40 moms just kind of jumped on. They're like, we need to talk because <laughs> caregiving is hard. And now I'm caregiving and my other kids are home from school. And so now I've lost that opportunity oh. to have this, this a, a little bit of time for myself or just time with the child that they're caring for separate from the kids that weren't affected. So week after week we met. And so I formed relationships with two other moms in particular, both who have either teenagers or actually my kids are the oldest. So theirs are still teenagers. So we would meet. And then as the year progressed, the year mark came, most of us were still meeting and then people went back to work and the zoom groups got fewer and fewer and fewer as it should have. Um, but the three of us were still so connected. And so now it's almost three years later, we were just on zoom last night. One's in Salt Lake oh. city. One's in Chicago. I'm here. We meet at nine o'clock at night. Cause that's the best time that works for us. And the fact that I can be awake at nine o'clock at night, that's a signal of healing because that was <laughs> that one. a while ago. And we know what it's like to have kids with Lyme. We know what it's like. I can talk to them. And even though they aren't diagnosed, they can relate to how I'm feeling and having that sense of community, even though it's over zoom is it's, it's carried me through. Like I've mentioned these women and and other people that I've talked to because I can't really even go to my own family. They don't get what my life is like. They don't get what having multiple people in a house with Lyme disease is like. They don't get the financial stresses that can come with three people in treatment for Lyme. Um, But these friends do like, they get it. They get the fact that my daughters have struggles that aren't typical of 20 and 22 year olds. Their life is slightly different. So we're some people don't mean to judge, but they do these friends, they get it. And there there's, it's like a no judgment zone. They just, we can just talk and share whatever it is that we're feeling, whatever it is that we're going through with our kids, whatever our life with Lyme looks like in that, that moment that we're in and they just listen and it's, it's meant the world to me. So find your tribe, find your, your community, whether it's, you know, through a church or through your neighborhood friends or through zoom, you know, whatever it is, connect with people because you can't, you can't do chronic illness alone. It's, it's too much of a burden. It's too heavy. It's too hard. So you need to have somebody that will just listen when you need to talk and and not offer you advice and not give you platitudes of, Oh, it's going to get better. And just listen to you, just listen to you cry. If that's what you need to do. And then 
move on. So yeah, find your tribe, build your community. Yeah, agree with that tremendously. Um, at least you don't feel so uh, different or alone or just like broken. Oh, exactly. You know, mm-hmm. Whatever words we could fill in that blank with um, when you're trying to do it alone. Yep. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to share all this with me. And oh, I welcome. just feel like you're a very smart, wise woman, very well, beautiful soul. And keep going with what you're doing because it makes a tremendous difference in our world. And we need lots more people like you. Um, and I, I really, like, I listen to all the things that you're doing and it's very humbling and you're a real powerhouse. So oh, I'll never oh, forget thank that. You. And I, yeah. would, I would say the same for you. So you know, yeah. talk to, to the people that replied to you, capture everyone's stories, and then, you know, translate them into your words and put them out there so that people know that there's, there's a better way to do life. There's a better way to heal. And that we're, we're in this together that, you know, no one's really kind of going through this alone. And if it's not Lyme, everybody's got their thing, you know, like everybody has their thing. So whatever your thing is, whatever you've been tasked to, to deal with, there's, you know, there's a happy, healthier way to walk through it. Um, I think as, as long as you're not trying to go it alone, like, cause that's just, it's just too hard. So yeah. So keep doing what you're doing. I, I support you hundred percent. If there's anything else that I can do, um, I'm happy to, and to use the platform that I have to, if you need more people, if you want to, if you want me to put anything out there looking for more people to talk to, I'd be happy to do that. So you just let me know what you need and we'll definitely support each other. Thank you. Thank you. You're I welcome. appreciate that. And you know, that is mutual. So mm-hmm. whatever I can do for you as well, but I do Hi, appreciate your you. time tremendously. No, you're very welcome. Awesome. I can't wait till this is done. All right. Start with you guys. Do it. Yep. Thank you. All right. Bye. Talk to you soon. Bye. Okay.